Too isolated, some people said. El Jefe's two-story concrete house sat on top of the mountain above a cluster of little palm huts that seemed to be barely holding on to the cliff. We craned our necks every time we went by. What did we think we'd see? A young girl brought here for a forced rendezvous? The old man himself walking around his grounds, beating the side of his shiny boots with a riding crop? The iron gateway blazed its five stars above the gleaming T. As we passed, our young soldier passengers saluted, though no guards were in sight. We drove by shabby palm huts. The one time we had stopped here to stretch our legs, the whole little village had gathered, offering to sell us anything we might want to buy. Things are bad, the villagers complained, looking up towards the big house. Rufino pulled over and rolled up the side flaps. A welcome breeze blew in, laden with the smells of damp vegetation. Ladies, Rufino asked us before climbing back in, if you'd like to stop. Patria was sure she did not want to stop. This was her first time, and the road was a little spooky until you got used to it. Just as we were rounding the curve, on that stretch where the house shows the most from the road, I glanced up. Why, look who's there, I said, pointing to the big white Mercedes that sat by the front door. All three of us knew at the same instant what it meant. An ambush lay ahead. Why else was Peña at La Cumbre? We had seen him just this morning in Santiago when we picked up our permissions. Patria's chatty friend had made no mention of being headed in our direction. We couldn't turn around now. Were we being followed? We stuck our heads out the window to see what lay behind as well as ahead. I give myself to San Marco de Leon, Patria intoned, repeating the prayer for desperate situations. I found myself mouthing the silly words. Panic was rising from my toes, through my guts, into my throat. The thunder in my chest exploded. Mate was already wheezing, searching through her purse for her medication. We sounded like a mobile sanatorium. Rufino slowed. Shall we stop at the three crosses? Up ahead on a shoulder were three white crosses marking the casualties from a recent accident. Suddenly, it loomed in my head as the place for an ambush, the last place we should stop. Keep on going, Rufino, I said, and I took great swallows of the cool air that was blowing in on us. To divert ourselves, Mat and I began moving the contents of our old purses into our new ones. The card of Jorge Almonte, attendant, El Gallo, found its way to my hand. The gold rooster logo crowed from the upper right-hand corner. I turned the card over. The words were written in big block letters in a hurried hand. Avoid the path. My hand shook. I would not tell the others. It could only make things worse, and Mate's asthma had just begun to calm down. But in my own head, I was working it all out. It was a movie scene that became suddenly, terrifyingly real. This soldier was a plant. How foolish we'd been, picking him up on this lonely country road. I began chatting him up, trying to catch him in a lie. What time was he due at the fort, and why had he hitched rather than caught a ride in an army truck? Finally, he turned around halfway in his seat. I could see that he was afraid to speak. I'll coax it out of him, I thought. What is it? You can tell me. You ask more questions than me, mujer, when I get home, he blurted out. His color deepened at the rude suggestion that I could be like his wife. Patria laughed and tapped my head with a gloved hand. That coco fell right on your head. I could see she, too, felt sure of him now. The sun broke through the clouds, 
and shafts of light shone like blessings on the far valley. The ark of his covenant, I thought. I will not destroy my people. We had been silly, letting ourselves believe all those crazy rumors. To entertain us, Mate began telling riddles she was sure we hadn't heard. We humored her. Then Rufino, who collected them, knowing how much Mate loved them, offered a new one to her. We began to descend towards the coast, the roadside growing more populous, the smell of the ocean in the air. The isolated little huts gave way to wooden houses with freshly painted shutters and zinc roofs, advertising Ron Bermudez on one side, Yossi Trujillo on the other. Our soldier had been laughing loudly at the riddles he always guessed wrong. He had one of his own to contribute. It turned out to be much nastier than any of Mate's. Rufino was indignant. Adio! Are you forgetting there are ladies in the car? Patria leaned forward, patting a hand on each man's shoulder. Now, Rufino, every egg needs a little pepper. We all laughed, glad for the release of the pent-up tension. Mate crossed her legs, jiggling them up and down. We're going to have to stop soon unless you quit making me laugh. She was famous for her tiny bladder. In prison, she'd had to practice holding it in since... She didn't like going out to the latrine with strange guards in the middle of the night. Everybody's serious, I ordered, because we sure can't stop here. We were at the outskirts of the city now. Brightly colored houses sat prettily in their kempt plots, side by side. The rain had washed the lawns, and the grasses and hedges shone emerald green. Everything was a fresh joy to see. Groups of children played in puddles on the street, "'scattering as the jeep approached so as not to be sprayed. "'An impulse seized me. I called out to them, "'We're here, safe and sound.' "'They stopped their play and looked up. "'Their baffled little faces did not know what to make of us, "'but I kept waving until they waved back. "'I felt giddy, as if I'd been granted a reprieve from my worst fears. "'When Mate needed a piece of paper for her discarded chiclet, "'I pulled out Jorge's card.' Manolo was upset at his mother for letting us come alone. She promised me she wouldn't let you out of her sight. But my love, I said, folding my hands over his, reason it out. What could Doña Fefita do to protect me even if I were in danger? I had a brief, ludicrous picture of the old, rather heavy woman banging a seam calle over the head with her ubiquitous black purse. Manolo pulled and pulled at his ear, a nervous habit he had developed in prison. It moved me to see him so nakedly affected by his long months of suffering. A promise is a promise, he concluded, still aggrieved. Oh, dear, there would be words next time, and in Doña Fefita's tears all the way home. Manolo's color had started to come back. This was definitely a better prison, brighter, cleaner than La Victoria. Every day, our friends Rudy and Pilar sent over a hot meal, and after they ate, the men were allowed to walk around in the prison yard for half an hour. Leandro, the engineer, joked that he and Manolo could have mashed at least a ton of sugarcane by now, if they'd been rigged up with a harness like a team of oxen. We sat around in the little yard where they usually brought us during our visits if the weather was good. Unaccountably, after the bad storm, the sun had come out in the late afternoon. It shone on the barracks, painted a pea-green, amoeba-shaped camouflage that looked almost playful, on the storybook towers with flags flying in a row, on the bars gleaming brightly, as if someone had taken the time to polish them. If you didn't let yourself think what this place was, you could almost see it in a promising light. Tentatively, Patria brought up the topic. Have you been told anything about being moved back? Leandro and Manolo looked at each other. A worried look passed between them. 
Did Pedrito hear something? No, no, nothing like that, Patria soothed them. And then she looked to me to bring up what the young soldier had reported in the car, that two politicals would be going back to La Victoria in a few weeks. But I didn't want to worry them. Instead, I began to describe the perfect little house we'd seen earlier. Patria and Mate joined in. What we didn't tell the men was that we had not rented the house, after all. If they were going to be moved back to La Victoria, there was no use. The big white Mercedes, parked at the door of La Cumbre, crossed my mind. I leaned forward, as if to leave its image physically at the back of my mind. We heard the clanging of doors in the distance. Footsteps approached. There were shouted greetings, the click and slap of gun salutes. The guard was changing. Patria opened her purse and withdrew her scarf. Ladies, the shades of night begin to fall. The wayfarer hurries home. Nice poetry. I laughed to lighten the difficult moment. I had such a hard time saying goodbye. You're not going back tonight. Manolo looked shocked at the idea. It's too late to start out. I want you to stay with Rudy and Pilar and head back tomorrow. I touched his raspy cheek with the back of my hand. He shut his eyes, giving himself to my touch. You mustn't worry so. Look how clear that sky is. Tomorrow we'll probably have another bad storm. We're better off going home this evening. We all looked up at the deepening golden sky. The few low-lying clouds were moving quickly across it, as if heading home themselves before it got too dark. I didn't tell him the real reason why I didn't want to stay with his friends. Pilar had confided in me as we drove around looking at houses that Rudy's business was about to collapse. She didn't have to say it, but I guessed why. We had to put more distance between us, for their sake. Manolo held my head in both his hands. I wanted to lose myself in his sad, dark eyes. Please, mi amor. There are too many rumors around. I reasoned with him. If you gave me a peso for every premonition, dream, admonition we've been told this month, we'd be able to buy ourselves another set of purses. Mata held hers up and nodded for me to hold up mine. Then there was the call. Time! The guards closed in, their flat, empty faces showing us no consideration. Time! We stood, said our hurried goodbyes, our whispered prayers and endearments. Remember, don't forget. Dios te bendiga, mi amor. A final embrace before they were led away. The light was falling quickly. I turned for a last look, but they had already disappeared into the barracks at the end of the yard. We stopped at the little restaurant gas pump on the way out of town. The umbrellas had all been taken down in preparation for night, and only the little tables remained. Since Mata and Patria were thirsty and wanted a refreshment, I went and made the call. The line was busy. I paced back and forth in front of the phone the way one does to remind someone ahead that others are waiting. But neither Mama nor the dead could know that I was waiting for them to get off the line. Still busy, I came back and told my sisters. Mata picked up her new purse and mine from the extra chair. Sit with us. Come on. But I couldn't see how I could sit. I guess it was getting to me, listening to everyone's worries. Give it another five minutes, Patria suggested. It seemed reasonable enough. In five minutes, whoever was on would be off the line. If not... It was a sure sign that one of the children had left the phone off the hook, and who knew when Tono or Fela would discover it. Rufino leaned against the back of the jeep, his arms crossed. Every so often he'd look up at the sky, checking the time. I think maybe I will have a beer, I said at last. Epa, Mate said. She was drinking her lemonade through a straw, daintily, like a girl, trying to make this sweet pleasure last. We would be stopping at least once more on the road. I could see that.